How are you today? Excellent. Welcome. My name is Patrick O'Donnell. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at the museum, and we have a really uh, special treat. Today we've got the illustrator, Greg Manches, illustrator, author of Above the Timberline. And today we're going to uh, do a little draw and tell of polar bears, where we're going to tackle this handsome fellow behind us, draw him, and Greg is going to explain a little bit about what he's looking at, thinking about, and trying to recreate in his images. It's easy to be overwhelmed when you look at a collection such as Above the Timberline. It's very complex, it has intense imagery, it's wonderful to look at, and you might think, where do I start? Well, you start here, with us. Right? That's best. Now, you're the master, right? And I'm <laughs> your absolute favorite student. Those are your words. Right? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. So, right out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what do you say we. Uh, oh, we're going to start now. Let's get uh, right to it. What do you say? Well. Is everyone ready or does anyone have any questions before we get going? Well, Patrick and I were going to bring in a real polar bear, but we thought it would get kind of ugly. The OSHA so compliance yeah. was just a nightmare. We didn't do it. I had a real polar bear when I was doing the book, but yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> not really, no. no. Okay. All right. How are we starting? I'd say we go from big, big shapes to small Ooh. shapes. Ooh, like good that? answer. I like that. I've taught right, him right. well. We pray, yeah, we practiced this before, uh, <laughs> before the show started. Greg and I actually sat down in a studio, which is incredible because it, just like the exhibit, it's filled with all this wonderful art. And uh, he drew better than I did in the demo, which... <laughs> Made me a little irritated, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but in the beginning, let's just think. Just think. Don't think polar bear, right? This is not a polar bear, even though it looks pretty close to one. It's just shapes, big round shape right here, and then big bunch of black, like round. These guys are round, but then we'll get into a little more of the detail and stuff of the shapes from there. But just think of these round points right there. A big round circle and you're halfway home to polar bear at that point. You are laughing, but it's true. <laughs> okay. All right, what do you think? Should we get uh, we'll draw the big shapes first? Big shapes. Greg and I just had some simple little sticks of charcoal. Okay, that's hopefully everyone will be able to see our construction lines. And, uh, Mine has all the talent in it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. true. It's true. No, but I switched them when you weren't looking. Oh, so, yeah. dang. <laughs> God. All right, all right here, here we, we go. go. So Whoops. we're going to go for what? Big, 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 big main big, shebang, right? Big shapes. Okay. And just as I said, look at the big shapes as a circle, I'm, I'm going to square mine off. Yeah. Sorry. All right. I think it was well. <laughs> and a little tip, too, is when you start doing your initial drawing, draw lightly. That way, when you go back in with the lines you choose, you don't have to compete with your construction lines. So, if anyone can't see what I'm drawing, good. <laughs> <laughs> see, I'm already halfway there, or getting close anyway. And <laughs> probably need a little bit more room for the ear here, so I'm adjusting it. Yeah, see, he's not wide enough, so I'm just going to take it a little bit farther over. These light lines don't matter because we'll, we won't see them later. It's also a little bit of character when you accent some of the shapes. So they don't have to be exactly perfect. And see my ears, my ears up way too high. Look, I can't even erase it. It's called failing right there. See, look how big that ear is, wow. <laughs> what happened? Wow. Oh, she's coming. Oh, yeah. is, it, is it good? Oh, okay, all right. Just getting started. <laughs> when did you sign it, oh, too? Oh, man, I've been playing that all week. <laughs> if you knew. If you only knew. All right. Can everyone see okay? Everyone see the construction lines? Yeah, watch this guy, because you got to keep track of him. Yeah. 
doing the nose. I'm going to figure out where that eye is, right about there. His ear's going to have to go off the edge. So the other thing about this, uh, capturing the <clears throat> shape, this part of the polar bear is kind of a box. See that? square -ish shape. And then this, start to see the square shape on that all within a round shape. Mm -hmm. I got that from John Nagy, How to Draw, way back in the day. And he did a puppy. And he did the puppy's nose kind of squared off like that. And so it's reminding me I'm having a visual memory thing here going on. <laughs> oh, the puppy. Yeah. It's the, like a polar He's got a nice big bulky kind of maw going on, huh? Yeah. The nose is kind of a square with bumps on it. Yep. And we cropped out the Coca-Cola can. So <laughs> <you're coming. laughs> Well, that was going to be hard to do the label. Yeah. <laughs> How's everybody doing? <laughs> they sound like they're having a good time. Right? Yeah, really. Now, Greg, what time, at what point are you comfortable starting to explore the tonality, start to block in the shapes here? Well, once I get the basics in, like these eyeballs and stuff, uh, then I can start to go on more of the subtle tones, I guess, you know? Mm -hmm. um, this one, I can see the eyeball in there, but um, if you just went with shape, you'd probably just color in the whole dark shape of the eye. I'm putting in a little bit of the reflection and stuff in the eye. Pretty subtle uh, value. But I'm starting to stay really pretty black at first. You see my eyes are my eyes are off here a little bit. You know if we had crayon it'd probably be easier. <laughs> <laughs> Polar red noses are kind of complex. I mean. Yeah. But if you just make them dark and cool, then they look they look pretty good. You know, you'll notice on your pencil too that uh, if you keep changing the edge a little bit, it'll go flat or sharp if you're using the edge and the side and you keep turning it. That way the point doesn't dull. Does that make sense? So if it's dulling, you can just move it to its side and use that for actually nice little very thin strokes, and then it'll go back to pointing again. So that's one way to keep your pencils a little sharp as you go through this. I'm almost done. How about you? <laughs> Now I'm doing some of the subtle stuff. How about you? Where are you? Uh, getting into that nose shape. There's like a couple uh, complex in that bigger form. Trying to carve in with the side, sort of chisel out some forms here. Anybody know about polar bear hair? It's yeah, it comes off that way. It's actually hollow. It's little tubes, and all the each hair acts as a little uh, hothouse to collect the sunlight and and stay warm. And then the polar bear skin is jet black, so it absorbs sunlight. So if you see a skinless polar bear, it'd be all black. There's some shots of stuff like that. It's kind of weird to look at, but. Tell them about how they hide their noses. Oh, yeah. Well, when they're sneaking up on their prey, they know enough that their noses show up against all that white background that they, they put their paw in front of their nose to disguise it. Uh, this behavior has been seen over and over again. Sometimes I wonder if it's not for some other certain condition they're trying to work out. But uh, as far as we know, they, they understand that 
seals and other prey can pick up on that and they cover it up to hide. One thing to remember too is you can always go darker, but you can't always go lighter. So it's always good to just stay light in the beginning until you're ready to put in some of the dark stuff. Greg, what is the thing that made you the most interested in the polar bear and to feature them so much in above uh, the timberline? I mean, they're not the conventional pack animal, right? Exactly, right. I thought, what is probably the craziest pack animal that you could have? Something that would be dangerous and scary, and polar bears came to mind pretty quickly. Also because I love to paint the shapes their shapes are just so fascinating. They're nice and big and sculptural. And uh, it works for big, fat brushwork. So I was playing to my strengths there. Yes. Makes sense? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I could put in a big old piece of white uh, brushwork, and it would help uh, define the polar bear shape. And also, I'd been doing polar bears since I got reaction to that back in art school, which was the reaction was, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought if it bothered them, I'll just keep doing it. Is this your first artistic act of rebellion? Yeah. <laughs> ha, I'm doing a polar bear. There, <laughs> take that. Well, also, no one else was doing polar bears, so I thought, Maybe I was on, in on something. <laughs> How's everybody doing so far? <laughs> Giggles, all right. That's a good sign. There's some professionals in the room too, you know. And they could probably come up and share their work as well. Don't forget to use the side of the pencil as well. <laughs> Someone forgot. <laughs> the pencil was the first tool I ever used to understand drawing. How about you? Yep. You start with the pencil? Yeah. Seems like everybody starts yeah, with a pencil. Yeah. What was the pencil we were drawing with at your studio? Uh, Blackwing. Blackwing. Black and why do you prefer that one? It's, the black wings are nice and soft, and they respond to every mark um, in a way that is exactly what you tell it to do. And it's all about the pressure of the of the mark, and if, if you have a pencil that responds really well, like one that's soft, then it will pick up your intention, in a sense, and you drive it that way. That sounds uh, a little lofty, but... No, I, I, like I, like no, I was just thinking about when we finished drawing the first time, and you said, okay, can I try something? I said, okay. Oh, yeah. You took that, you took that makeup brush and just went... Right across my drawing. Yeah, yeah, I smeared it. That's right. Yeah. I don't have a big enough makeup brush for this one. <laughs> How's everyone else it's coming out? Huh? Yeah, we doing all right? I'm hearing the toil of a million pencils on paper. That's <laughs> good. That's good. <laughs> you can make uh, different marks too. 
side of the pencil, the point of the pencil, a dull pencil, a sharp pencil. Make sense? You guys are like already there, right? I mean, look how fast. It doesn't take much to do a polar bear, right? right. <laughs> look at this. He's already done. Did you pull another one out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got like 10 in here. Huh? It's crazy. <laughs> So the other thing you can do is give a polar bear character beyond what you're looking at a little bit. So his eyes are a little doleful there, but if I accent and angle over the top of the brow, then he gets a little more focused. And if I angle the back of it up a little bit, then he gets a little sadder on that side. So you can change that a little bit. Something to think about when you first start the polar bear, not after you've <laughs> already drawn it in there. You can also change the light a little bit on the polar bear by accenting certain uh, shapes and darkening them in. So don't think of the polar bear as white either. Take a look at its value meaning it's darks and lights. And um, when you do that, then it's, it's all about the lightness of the shape and the darkness of the shape. You can also make them a little bit friendlier if you just bend the corner of the mouth upward a little bit. They tend, it's pretty easy to make them smile. <laughs> It's easy to make them sad, it's easy to make them mad, depending on the angles in the eye and the corners of the mouth. Not much you can do about a nose, uh, it's just big and black. All right, I'm out. What about you? Uh, yeah, I'm How do we do? I'm fiddling now. Are you erasing? No, no. Does this <laughs> erase? Really? Yeah. Here, you can carve right in. Look at that. Wow, I can lighten this right here. So that'll knock that back a little bit. So the other thing too, if you're drawing at home, you have a nice soft pencil, you can smear it and then erase out some of the highlights. So this is a little dark up in here. So I just knocked it back a little bit and uh, now it rounds it out a little more. Squinting is important. So you squint at the reference, but look at your drawing. So when you squint at the drawing and look at the reference, you're getting the opposite thing. You're getting too much information, and then the drawing doesn't measure up to that. So you want to squint at your drawing and look at the reference. That makes sense? Yeah. You just want to get to the rhino, don't you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm racing. When I made up the rhino in the, above the timberline, I was coming from the idea that what is the dumbest, most ridiculous creature that would be up in some kind of wild, uh, cold environment? And I thought, oh, it'd be perfect to do a, a, a rhino. That would never be up there. Oh, and it's cold, so I'll put hair on it. Perfect. And then I reinvented the woolly rhino. I, was, I should have had a giraffe or something in there. Right? Yeah, yeah. That would have been dangerous. Yeah. Giraffes moving. <laughs> Scaly giraffe. Hey, that looks like the reference. What are you trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you lifted some out of there, cheater. Yeah. <laughs> well, I give you an eraser. I share it. All right. Okay. I got it. Oh, can I do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, now yeah, you can go right through it. Edge. Look at that. Now it looks like hair. Look so, just like Greg said, if you look where I had the highlights, I can create a chiseled edge. That is, make the form look rigid right there, but then taper off the other side and soften that, right? So that way it looks like the form is rounding over. Because not everything, it's polar bear, right? So, it's not made of plate metal, it's not welded together edges, it has strong edges though from its bone structure but then some of the form <coughs> becomes soft and rounded and you can have your eraser help you do that hmm. 
It's a lot about edges. Hard edges and soft edges. Lost edges and found edges. Uh, so those edges will define whether a form recedes or comes forward. The sharper it is, the more forward it comes. The softer it is, the more it drops back. So when we're looking at, if you've drawn before and you're looking at reference and you see background and you draw it real soft, you're feeling the right idea because it's, it's dropping back away from the front. If you need something to sharpen up in focus, you actually want sharper, more rigid lines in that foreground area. And it brings it right up front again. Wow. Do we get to walk around and look at these? That looks yeah, great, yeah, Brian. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, I see a lot of polar bears. Jeez. <laughs> All right, let's see. So to what Greg was talking about a little bit earlier about uh, lost found edges, I also do something right here, if you notice the corners of the ear, I just make the line a little bit darker. That's a sort of mimic condition that's called an occlusion shadow. And an occlusion shadow is where two forms meet. The very closest portion is the darkest. You can check it when you squish your hands together and there's a line, there's a tiny little bit of dark there, an occlusion shadow. And you can mimic that, and that's what I did. But your eye is trained for pattern recognition. So just these little indicators help you, the viewer, fill out the rest of the object. Occlusion shadows. Occlusion shadows. Something I did not learn in art school. Yeah, no, me either. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys ready for a rhino? Who's ready for a rhino? rhino? It's going to be a little complex, a little more complex. Little it's going to be a polar bear with a horn on it. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Want to do it? Yeah, that's so. Cool. All right. All right. So that one, again, is kind of like round boxes, right? Big big sort of tr rectangle right through here, a little sloping rectangle. Yeah. These guys you know how to do, that's no problem. Huh? Big circle for the eyeball. You can even get away with a triangle too, right? So has everyone seen this, basic shapes? So Greg and I are creating a plan of attack here, and if you look, Greg is saying there's a square here, and he's right, but you could also theoretically get away with a triangle. Exactly. You see? Yeah. And you can break it down, the eyes, are circles. The nose is an upside down triangle. Obviously the horns are triangles. And the ear is sort of a kind of a kidney bean shape. Okay, so we've got this established, right? Now let's find another landmark. Like Greg said, the eye is a circle, right? Well, if we look at the way we've plotted this, it's kind of somewhere right about there, right? And you place those things by looking at Landmarks. Mm -hmm. Does that make, make sense? So the eye is rear of that horn, just behind it a little bit, and in front of the ear, obviously, but it's right about where the forehead comes down in there, and it's just about almost in the center of that box. And then if you notice, the front horn is kind of at an angle, right? Yeah. See that? It slopes down. Mine, it looks like, is not going to stay on the page. <laughs> I'm still looking at general shapes like triangles and circles, mm -hmm. rectangles. If you look at that nostril, right, what is it? It's just a triangle, right? So bring a line out from the eye. It's about a little step down, right about here. All right. And then what do we have? Up high, we've got the ear, which is kind of, uh, I'm going to draw it over here if you look. The ear is sort of this shape, right? It's kind of a kidney bean shape. So we'll throw that up here. Around. Oh, kidney bean. Yeah. There you go. Uh, my kidney bean isn't quite beany enough. <laughs> then you got the other ear behind where you just see the top. Okay. It's interesting, too, is sometimes. 
know, we're all familiar with what a rhinoceros is, but until you actually sit down and study it and look at it, find all those particular things and the uniqueness of its features that make it so distinct. It's like when we tell our, I tell my students, you know, everyone's seen a fire hydrant, right? But if I have you draw one out of your head, it won't look 100% correct, right? Because memory's an imperfect thing. That's why illustrators go through the trouble of gathering so much reference so that they can make a more informed, incredible image. So it's about the observation. So in, when I'm talking with my students on my online class, most of the time we're talking about observing observing the form. It's all about the observation of it. Of it. If you can't really detect what you're looking at, then you really can't reproduce what you're looking at. So you have to see it for the shape that it is, not the actual thing that it is. When we're working in, in oil paint, I try to tell them to get away from thinking of hair as hair. To see it as a large shape on someone's head. And when you think of hair as shape, you can actually get a better representation of hair than if you think hair. There's that whole uh, drawing on the right side of the brain many, many years ago. And what, what she was trying to do is get people to not see the subject. So she would have them turn the reference material upside down and just draw the shape. So if you're drawing a figure that way, you can only see the shapes and you don't usually think of arms and fingers and hands and eyes and all the rest. And to Greg's point, when you, you know, again, there's no lines that our hands can produce that yours can't, right? Right. It's a matter of distilling information. When you see, you look at somebody, you know that there's hair on their head, you know something's made of wood, you know you're standing on carpet you're already receiving visual cues that tell you what you're looking at. You already know. All you're doing is identifying what the visual markers are for those cues and then repeating them in line. And that's how you create the illusion of varying textures. What I, he said. Or did I just make that up? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> that's what the cue card said, I don't know. <laughs> So once you get those markers in, then you can start to uh, go back and identify a little bit more of the shape. Kind of like doing that on the eye right now. This guy's kind of a cool example, too, of where you can erase back into the shadows to create that leathery skin texture. One of the tricks I like to do is, see how I have the shadow here, is I can actually cut lines in, okay, with an eraser. I'm going to do this vice versa. And take my charcoal and bring the line out. Can you see? Because the place that you see the texture most is right where the form is rolling in to shadow, okay? So just those see those three, as Greg showed me, you know, our tendencies and inclinations are to include everything that we see. But that's not necessarily what makes for the most successful illustration. Sometimes what you exclude is as important is what you include. So with just a few little lines, like so, we can create that sense of that really wrinkly leather texture, right? Yeah, the leaving things out part is... Yeah, it's counterintuitive. Uh, yeah, and very much a decision-making process. You have to decide where it goes or doesn't go. You can make easy wrinkles if you use the side of your pencil, twist and turn it as you pull the line. It'll make thick and thin lines and they resemble wrinkles. 
something that every young artist loves to draw, those photographs of older people who have loads and loads of wrinkles and they love getting in there and organizing them. Abandon it? <gasps> Never. Never. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, usually, the way that works now, though, is I, I'll be doing those little thumbnail sketches and abandon those like crazy, uh -huh. working it out until I get one. Ooh, now I got something. And I start to work that a little bit more uh, with focus. And still, they can just keep. I can keep missing something that I feel I want and it's not on the paper yet. But I just keep working those until I get something. If if it's a hard struggle to get to that, like, you know, you've done 65 thumbnails and you're just close to it, I'll project that thumbnail to blow it up so I can keep the life of the thumbnail and then draw it again. And now I've got proportions going on that I had when it was really tiny. Because you can blow things up when they're small to any size. But you can't start large and reduce it and have it hold together much. It's easier to start small and work up. So over the years, starting small, that cuts out a lot of mistakes right away. So by the time I get to a finished drawing and then a finished painting, I've already done the groundwork. I know where it's going. And the mistakes are a little bit like a performance on stage where you improvise or compensate at that point. A lot of this is just rehearsal. This is rehearsal for the final performance of painting, right? And the students heard that when I, when I tell them that. They're like, oh, you mean I, I practice it for a while, and then I do the performance? Yeah. And I didn't get that in art school. <laughs> I got it from drawing hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Blythe and, and Rockwell being one of them, a couple of them, uh, they did studies and stuff. I don't get a lot of time to do studies in illustration, but uh, Lion Decker did a lot of studies and then would, would paint it because he'd put in enough research to know where he was going when he was on the canvas working again. And Rockwell's done any number of excellent studies and drawings to prepare for a uh, specific painting. We, you know, we grew up in this world where we want to get an A the first time. I love what you're saying about the process and the study. It's like, don't worry about, you know, I got my star and the A plus. It's just all a big cycle of growth. Yeah. The um, process is so much more important, uh, sometimes more than the finish. But uh, the finish is kind of a, a demonstration of the process. And there's a point at which uh, you either stop or you ruin it. <laughs> Or you have to loosen it back up again. And that's all part of the process as well. Uh, I heard someone talking about Picasso doing Guernica and that he went down these false trails trying to figure out how to draw this bull that's in the painting. He kept saying about how he was wrong and it was false. And all I could hear him saying was that Picasso was on the trail of research. He was discovering. It's not that they were wrong or the false trails. They were absolutely the trails he had to go down to bring back the information. But we don't, as a, as a culture, we don't see that as part of the process. We just see that it was a failure, a point that he abandoned to get back to something else. But sometimes we have to make those mistakes to understand where we're going in the first place. You could probably do this with your pencil too, but. I forgot to do some rubbing because Patrick gave me charcoal to work with today. And uh, Wild card. 
there's another level of subtlety with the rubbing like this that you can create for value that takes it another step toward uh, realism a little bit. And I can modify this. I'm also staying quite loose. See, it's, I'm going outside the lines. <laughs> Like, you know, our entire society doesn't want you to color outside the lines, but artists do it naturally. When you do that, you give something like this a lot of motion. Just outside the lines. Now I can come back in with my uh, eraser and pull out some of the highlights again to accent those edges. and get a little shine onto the front of the eyeball there on the rhino. Now I'm controlling the shapes with the value. When you're not worried about being accurate, then uh, you give more character to the line. And then that gives more character to the drawing, and then you can take it wherever you want. So I'm not paying too much uh, attention to being correct in certain things like staying within the lines and things like that. So I can come in and control that. How's the rhino? You done? I think it's time to call it. Getting close. Does anybody have yeah. any questions for Greg or I? Wrap up. Does everyone want to hold up their drawing? So. Oh yeah, you yeah, guys got to hold we, up your we drawing. We want to see them all here. We're... All right. Nice. Nice. Cool. Oh no, keep them up. Hold on. Oh, these are great. These are great. Unbelievable. Look at that. Every one of them's competition. So. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Hey. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. All right, you have a career in art waiting right. for you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everybody. Nice. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Here we go. Yay. Yes. <laughs>